Okay, we've got several questions on education, and we're going to switch over to Sasha Ryan from WDET. Judith, in our audience, wants to know about your plan for schools. So do you think Michigan schools have the resources they need to succeed? Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, they are prepared to serve all students, including special needs students? And do you think they are equitably funded? So, uh, Sasha, thank you for, um, for asking Judith's question. Judith, thank you for a great question. Uh, we have a number of challenges with our public education system. And to answer the three that you asked specifically, number one, we spend less per pupil per year on education than any other state in the Midwest, and I'm not trying to be Mississippi. Number two, it's deeply inequitable. There's about a $780 pay gap per student per year between the highest income and lowest income schools. Um, and that does not even include what's invested in the buildings themselves. I, as a health director, inspected city schools. I thought, saw things like mice dead in the corner that they'd been, they'd been there for days. They didn't just die. Um, gym floors buckling because of the amount of mold growing underneath them. And then when it comes to students with special needs, we have just fundamentally failed them. Uh, we've got a plan in terms of how we are going to be able to bring uh, Michigan's education system forward. It starts with de-DeVossing our public education system. We have watched as Betsy DeVos and her ilk have moved lockstep uh, through the GOP to defund public education and to create a system of for-profit operated charter schools who have fundamentally nipped at uh, the money that people like you and I pay to educate our kids putting that rather into companies' back pockets. So number one, we have to create an off-ramp for for-profit charter schools. We have to change the way that we authorize charter schools so that there's one authorizer that has to get uh, permits from local school districts. Every board would have to have both a parent and a teacher on the board. Second, we have to reinvest in public education again. That means investing in wraparound services like we did at the health department, providing every child a free pair of glasses. It means making sure that kids have access to counselors. Right now, the national average uh, of students to counselors is 491 to 1. In Michigan, it's 700 to 1. The number of librarians has dropped 63% since I graduated high school back in 2003. We've got to start reinvesting in the people who invest in our kids. And that means also investing in our teachers who've seen a pay cut every year for the past five years. And then when we, when we think about what education means, we need to make sure that every student graduating from our public schools is walking both paths an ac academic path and a career technical education path simultaneously and graduates both understanding uh, their way around a tool and die shop and pre-calculus. And then it's what we do on the caps as well. I'm the father of a uh, proud father of a, of a seven month old baby girl. And I know she's never going to be the learner she is today. Our capacity to learn uh, in terms of the human brain drops precipitously over time. And we're missing that crucial zero to five uh, age period. And that's why uh, we want to invest in a program that we're calling My Toddler. Uh, and My Toddler will provide every family access to early childhood education from zero to five when they start kindergarten. And then it's about what happens in, K in at postgraduate. Um, too many young people are graduating saddled with huge levels of debt. Uh, and what we've got to do is provide every single child coming from a family earning less than $150,000 a year access to a tuition-free and debt-free pathway to a two- or four-year public education in Michigan. We're calling that pro program My Scholars Grant. Um, and the My Scholars Grant would empower young people to be able uh, to, to, to pursue their education knowing that the state's got their back. And we know uh, that if we have their back, they'll have ours. Um, and the most important thing we can do for our economy, which I'm sure we'll get to, uh, is to make sure that we are winning the competition for our talented young folk. Um, and we've got to, got to keep them here in Michigan if we want to thrive into the future. So we understand that tests often are measuring socioeconomic factors and then used in our accountability systems. Do you feel that Michigan's accountability system is measuring schools fairly, presenting parents with fair measurements of the schools? Yeah. And should then those accountability systems be used to determine whether schools are closed? Look, I don't believe in closing down schools. As the health director in the city of Detroit, I talked to too many families uh, who are worried about their schools shutting down and the degree to which um, that is going to interrupt their ability to live their lives is huge. Too many folks have to travel too far. To get, to get their kids to schools. And so um, we know that the system of quote unquote accountability metrics just doesn't work because it measures poverty. The best predictor of whether or not a kid uh, is going to score high on that exam 
uh, is unfortunately what their family's income level is. And so rather than this punitive system uh, where we measure poverty and then fail to invest in low-income schools, instead we've got to be asking about how we close the gap in terms of what schools get. And I didn't refer to this in, in my last answer, but um, right now there's a $780 pay gap. We've got to close that down. The system by which we invest in school buildings that kids are learning in, that's got to be improved. And what we're uh, proposing is a system uh, through our Pure Michigan Infrastructure Bank proposal where we would have a full bank for school infrastructure. It would be funded by a statewide uh, uh, property tax millage. Um, and it would allow schools to use buildings they don't use, sell them off to the state, of course with local approval, then be able to take the money and invest it in the schools that they do use so kids are learning in good and safe uh, classrooms. But uh, right now the idea that somehow we should be measuring and punishing instead of measuring, understanding, and empowering, um, that, that doesn't make sense to me. And so we've got to be thinking uh, quite differently about how uh, we assess. Now look, um, it's really, really important to hold teachers accountable, but I think the accountability has a lot more to do with uh, the, the, the soft metrics of how a teacher is in the classroom and the way we're empowering. And certainly we shouldn't hold teachers accountable for the fact that we've disinvested uh, in the means of educating a child in the first place uh, and then ask them to be pulling superhero tricks uh, in the classroom because uh, it's just not fair. Um, and that's the, the reason why so many young people don't, get into an go, don't go into education anymore uh, is because they know it's punitive, they know they can't make the same uh, living that they could have in the past, um, and they know that they're going to be blamed for the failure of a system that has disinvested in, in schools. Regarding the My Scholars program, how do you plan on paying for that? What's, what's, what's your plan? So the state right now has about a $56 billion budget. Um, if you were to trace down all of the money that we use to subsidize huge corporations in the state of Michigan, it comes out to somewhere between 11 plus billion dollars. That ends up being about 20% of our annual budget every year. Um, and it comes down to deciding whether or not we as a state believe that the state's responsibility is to underwrite a huge number or a, in a huge way a number of corporations that have ultimately offshored or automated our jobs or the state's responsibility is to invest in people and places. I choose the latter. I think our responsibility as a state is to invest in our people and to invest in the places that they live, learn, work, pray, play. And in order to do that, that means investing in schools, investing in higher education, uh, investing in infrastructure. The money is there, the priorities are not. And so right now, the Michigan, Edu uh, the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, MEDC, uh, I think has become a vehicle that has lost its way. Um, and I think we've really got to be thinking about whether or not the investments that we're making now uh, are in the best interest of our, uh, of our community and the future of our state. So the money's there, the priorities are not. Second part of this though, is also working with, with Michigan public uh, education institutions to talk about why the cost of higher education has gotten so high in the first place. Um, and a lot of that is because of administrative cost. And so I'd love to work with uh, our public colleges and universities to ask, how can we start bringing down the cost uh, of administration in our, our public colleges and universities? Um, how do we make this more affordable over time? And in the interim, also start making the investments both through the My Scholars Grant and also uh, into uh, baseline grants to our higher education institutions so that we can meet in the middle. Um, because if we can't invest in our young people and we're not keeping them here, we will not have the kind of economy that we want for the future. And this is fundamentally about the future of Michigan. Our next question is more specifically about Detroit Public Schools, and that comes from Steve Carmody. Um, you mentioned uh, the need for improving uh, school infrastructure. Uh, Detroit Public Schools Community District, the largest in the state, has a major problem in that area. A recent report showed that about $500 million is needed to upgrade the facilities in the district. Um, but the district is constrained in its ability to uh, borrow money to be able to make those kinds of repairs. Uh, you mentioned your plan on dealing, the, dealing with this on a statewide level, but when it comes to Detroit's issues, does the Lansing need to do more to help the city of Detroit or help the, the Detroit School District deal with this problem, or can it at least make it easier for the district to borrow money? Look, um, Detroit Public Schools were under emergency management for the past seven years. And under those seven years, they nearly doubled the debt and did not solve any of the challenges that the school district faced. I do believe that the state of Michigan has a responsibility to the people of Detroit, and particularly the young people of Detroit, to be able to fix the set of problems that they were in part creating. And 
I believe that our school infrastructure bank would allow that kind of solution to come forward. Because what happens is in low income school districts in particular, you have uh, the lack of property tax revenue that invests in things like school infrastructure specifically. And I used to work with the good folks um, who uh, oversaw facilities at Detroit Public Schools Community District. And I'll tell you, uh, when we tested every single school for lead, we had uh, some, t some days were not the easiest conversations, but we knew we needed to get it done. But those folks work really hard with almost nothing uh, in terms of the resources that they have. And they're working with older and older buildings every year. Our program, this Pure Michigan Infrastructure Bank, and in particular the school infrastructure sub-bank, would allow our state the means of investing in lower income school districts that do not have the revenue cap capacity to invest in their school buildings itself. This is the way we need to solve it. And what it does is it leverages the bank aspect of the school infrastructure bank to buy out the number of buildings that already sit in Detroit public schools but are not being used and then redevelop them, them and then share the money that comes uh, through that back into the school district to allow them to invest. Um, this is a means of using what school districts uh, have but don't need to build what they need but don't have. Um, and that's why we believe that this is such an innovative solution and would really benefit community school districts like Detroit's and many uh, outstate and some of the rural communities that face very similar circumstances but just aren't as big and so don't get the same kind of attention. Would the school infrastructure bank, uh, when it takes on these properties and then resells them, would it resell them to, say, charter operators or other competitive school operations um, that would then possibly drain away some of the students? That's not what we're envisioning. Instead, um, uh, we, we're envisioning investing in redevelopment um, for, for mixed use. You know, you can imagine uh, both housing, you can imagine retail, um, you could imagine uh, taking those buildings down and, uh, and investing in manufacturing spaces, um, but, but not you know, just, just turning them around and flipping them uh, for a charter school. Um, and like I told you, I don't believe in for-profit charter schools. Uh, and I would seek to create an off-ramp for every for-profit charter school, uh, which would eliminate the financial incentive that so many charter operators have right now to just building more and more schools that don't really improve the educational capacity of the city or the state. So charter schools have come up a couple times now, and I think Hassan is going to drill down a little bit further into this topic. Right. So you talked about introducing accountability to charter schools, but uh, what types of changes to laws do you think Michigan should make uh, in how charter schools are, go are governed and funded? Yeah. It should be illegal to make money off of the tax dollars that you and I spend to educate our children. I do not believe in for-profit operated charter schools. I believe in legislation that would make it illegal after a certain point to open a for-profit charter school and would mandate movement from for-profit operations to non-profit operations uh, over a period of years. And, um, and I believe in that because uh, right now we're watching as n a number of, of, of for-profit operated charter schools are leveraging laxity in the rules that currently exist uh, to take advantage of circumstances, um, using count day and then all of a sudden kicking kids out of schools. Um, and we hear those stories. And look, there are some really high quality for-profit charter schools, but unfortunately we've got to think about the system here. And right now, the for-profit profit operation of charter schools, the incentives that exist in this current circumstance um, have decimated public schools, uh, and I believe that public schools should stay public. And so under my leadership, we would seek to uh, to sponsor and pass legislation uh, that would make it illegal for any uh, anybody to, to to profit off of uh, a, a charter school um, and would create a mandate to move to nonprofit uh, operations over time and then for nonprofit charter schools they would have to have a parent and a um, a, a teacher on the board uh, to stay operating and uh, they would have to be accountable to the same standards that that uh, that public schools are accountable to so that it would be fair to say that you would continue, uh, s you would support continuing uh, funding of charter schools with money allocated for public schools, if they were nonprofit, and um, and they meet those re requirements. I uh, I don't begrudge communities who say, well, we want to open a charter school that offers a certain extra set of uh, learnings for students, or uh, or in communities that have um, you know public schools, for example, that are far away. Um, or you know, legacy charter schools that currently exist that move to a nonprofit model. 
Again, I'm not into shutting down schools, right? Because that really just interrupts a family's uh, way of life and, and, and unrightly so. Um, but I do not believe that anybody should be pocketing the money that you and I pay to pay into our education system in tax dollars. All right. The uh, topic of uh, higher edu education has also come up so far and, and the costs associated with it. And Sandra is going to drill down a little bit further into that. Yeah, I think we heard earlier from you that the cost of higher education is considered prohibitively high in Michigan. So looking for a little more on the specifics of how you would address that as governor to make it more affordable for people. Well, let me tell you a story about a gentleman I met. He uh, graduated from the University of Michigan in 1968. That's, that's 50 years ago. Um, and he told me about how uh, his tuition at that time was 750 bucks, uh, and his um, his cost of living was about 1,100 bucks. And so he could get a job, and his job over the summer was was scooping ice cream, and uh, and he could afford uh, not only to pay his entire room and board and his educational costs, but a little extra on the side that he would enjoy with his friends. Um, Right now, uh, at the same university, the, the, the in-state in tuition is going to be $15,000 this year. Cost of living in, to live in Ann Arbor has skyrocketed, uh, let's say about $60,000 on the low end. Now you're talking about $75,000, upwards of 75 to 90, really, if you think about the inflation and the cost of housing. And um, I don't know anybody who can make $75,000 in the summer, frankly, uh, especially not if they're students, especially not scooping ice cream. And a lot of that is, is, is uh, the difference between how much the state used to subsidize higher education. At that point, it was about 75% subsidies. Today, it's about 25%. But a lot of those costs um, have been accounted for not by improvements in classroom teaching, not because we're paying professors or even lecturers more. In fact, uh, we're paying them on average less because more and more of the teaching faculty are not full-time uh, faculty. They're adjunct or lecturer faculty. And... Um, and most of it is driven by administrative costs. Uh, for most of the public colleges and universities, uh, I will have some say in uh, board appointments. Uh, and for those that are democratically elected, I really look forward to sitting down uh, and talking about what we can do to bring down those administrative costs. And in the meantime, investing more of our, uh, our, our state investments in uh, the, the baseline operations of those public colleges and universities and helping to subsidize uh, through helping to support uh, our young people who are graduating from Michigan high schools ready to go to Michigan public colleges and universities two or four year uh, through the My Scholars Grant. Um, look, this is an investment we need to be making. And uh, right now, we've got a lot of commitments that are being made to subsidize big uh, corporations over the next several years accounting for some concept that somehow these corporations have created jobs. They haven't. The past 10 years have shown us um, that our big corporations in Michigan have not yielded a net job. In fact, the Fortune 500 have not yielded a net job because of automation and offshoring. So the better investment here is to invest in our young people and then watch what they'll do. Um, there, there is the means to pay for it if we are willing uh, to have the priority of saying that our young people in their minds are worth more than the bottom lines of some corporation. And that's a commitment that I'm, I'm making. Uh, and I look forward to, to following that through, working together with the universities to bring down the inflation of their costs and also start investing in uh, their baseline operations and the students who go to their, uh, their, their campuses. Now at the other end of the education spectrum, uh, when associated with costs is preschool and, and childcare also. And Sasha Ryan has that question. You mentioned my toddler. Can you flesh out what that is and how that works and how you would make childcare and preschool available and accessible uh, to people in Michigan? Absolutely. <clears throat> so right now, when you think about sending uh, a young child to school, um, there's both the money that needs to be spent on behalf of the family to send that young child to, to school, to, to, to early childhood education. And then there's also the capacity to build out uh, the means of, of that investment, the structures that we need, right? Mm -hmm. Buildings, K through, uh, excuse me, uh, early childhood educators, those folks. So we've got to be able to solve both of them. What my toddler does is it makes investments uh, through an early childhood tax credit uh, that families can port and use to educate their uh, young child between the ages of zero and five. Um, and then it also uses state resources to make targeted investments in building out the infrastructure that we need. Now, um, there have been a lot of uh, leaders who've been thinking about this. Hope Starts Here is one uh, collaboration between Kellogg uh, and Kresge Foundation, as well as a number of, of leaders on the industry side uh, to be making those investments. The beautiful thing about this program, though, um, is not only does it empower our kids 
uh, minds in the moments that they're the most malleable and the most uh, important to be to be invested in. But it also um, creates this stream of really, really high quality, uh, potentially really well paying jobs that are really hard to automate out in an economy where automation has eaten at a lot of uh, a lot of jobs. And um, and if you think about if we were willing to do the work of investing in the workforce that is needed to be able to educate all of our young people between the ages of zero and five, there's a lot there. Um, and so want to work with these collaborations, be able to put some state money behind building the infrastructure and then leverage an early childhood tax credit to be able to empower families to pay for this. And then lastly, uh, we talk a lot about the gender wage gap. Um, so much of that is driven by the decisions that women are forced to make uh, after they've had a child between the ages of zero and five. Uh, my, my wife um, is a resident physician at the University of Michigan and um, you know, childcare is a really, really hard thing that we think about. Fortunately, we have my mother-in-law uh, who, um, who helps to take care of our baby girl uh, and she supported Sara and I uh, to be able to do the work that we're doing. Um, but a lot of families don't have that. And right now we're forcing uh, women and largely low income women um, out of the workforce to be able to take care of a child. And so early childhood investments is not just that investments in our future, it's also investments uh, in women in empowering them to be a part of the workforce if they so choose uh, to make sure that we've addressed the structural barrier that so many of them face um, that, uh, that, that, that they face because they're, they're having kids, uh, which is a, you know, a biologically um, a, a biologically important thing that we want uh, every family to be able to do without having to bear the consequences.